My name is Luca, Luca Bruno. Um, the topic of today is unsurprisingly whatever is on the schedule, which is Fedora Core OS and specifically the auto updating part. Um, our focus today is more or less giving an overview of what it means doing auto updates from the point of view of Fedora Core OS, um, what it means for an operator, sysadmin, SRE to manage this kind of like auto updating operating system, and how do we integrate all this discussion into an observability larger topic, which is how do we monitor, how do we alert when something goes wrong, and things like that. That's more or less just to set the, the scope of today. Um, <clears throat> my name is Luca, not, nothing special. Um, I'm an open source and an oper operating system, so that's OS, it's working fine. Um, engineer, um, I'm mostly a developer. Um, I write a bunch of stuff in several languages. I prefer and I usually work on Rust and Go. Um, I've been doing free software since many, many years. Um, I strongly believe in it, I support it. Uh, that's also why I'm working at CoreOS, at, sorry, at Red Hat. Um, before Red Hat, I used to work at CoreOS, CoreOS, the company. Um, then Red Hat, as most of you know, acquired CoreOS. I'm still here. Um, I used to work from Berlin, where CoreOS had a very small office. Um, we still have an office in Berlin, it's just that it's called a Red Hat office nowadays. Um, before doing this, I was into the security field, and specifically was in academia research. I was an engineer's less researcher doing security mostly, reverse engineering and um, modern baseband firmers. That's more or less the background about me. More interestingly, um, today we're gonna cover a lot of stuff. There is like a lot of contents in here. Um, I, don't, I don't pretend to explain you every single details, but just gives more or less like an overview and then zoom in some specific fields. Uh, the first one is for those of you that don't know what is Fedora Core OS, an overview of this, especially on the out of date things, uh, which is more or less a novelty or something done in a bit different way compared to the rest of Fedora spins. Um, and then we're gonna cover like components that are part of this auto updating stack, which is the server side, the protocol, Cincinnati, the client side, Zincati, and some other helpers that are like Airlock, the first one, local exporter, a second one that we're gonna describe later. And then finally, there is a demo where I'm a bit cheating because I'm not gonna do it live here this morning, but it's recorded and it's on YouTube already, so we're just gonna go through that. Um, so we're gonna just zoom into that direction and then see it all together in the end. Okie dokie. Um, so first, um, how many of you know what is CoreOS as a company? <laughs> a good bunch. How many of you knows what is CoreOS as an old operating system based on Gen 2 and Chromium? A few. How many of you knows Red Hat CoreOS? A few more. And how many of you know Fedora Corus? Okay, that's, that's, that's a good bunch. How many of you think that like naming things in computing is hard? <laughs> <laughs> I would have expected more hands. <laughs> Fine. Um, so here we're gonna like try to clear a bit of confusion when I say Core OS, I usually put something in front of it and here I'm trying to always say Fedora Core OS. If I omit that, it's still Fedora Core OS. Um, our goals with Fedora Corals basically was to um, bring some of the idea and some of the techniques that we were doing on the previous operating system called Container Linux by CoreOS, and before that it was called just CoreOS, um, into the Fedora world. Um, one of the main feature, one of the main idea, which is basically what I was working on, is um, having an operating system which is modeled after a continuous out update flows, that means that um, you, as an administrator, you don't have to care about going into every single machine and scheduling updates, doing yum install, apt install, or whatever. Um, but the operating system is taking care of that for you. And <clears throat> one step farther from that is um, we do this kind of continuous updates by using a model where the packages are not anymore like the main focus of what we do. Uh, but the main focus is we provide an OS image, which can be atomically updated and rolled back. Um, in container Linux, we were doing it at the file system level, so we were shipping a full OS image. Um, in Fedora Core OS, we are doing it at the OS3 level, which means that 
every operating system release that we make, it's a new OS3 commit, and we use RPM OS3 um, to update and switch between different commits that could be available on a single node. Um, that's, that's the basic of the operating system. From the point of view of how we, as in like distribution engineers and release engineers, um, we push out updates, um, there is something more that we want to provide, which is um, fa the phase rollout concept on top of multiple streams, which means that we provide you several streams that are going at different paces, like some are released more often, some are released with uh, a bit lower frequency, and you decide which one is the best fitted for you based on like how much stability do, do I need, how, how much new packages do I need, and so on and so far. Um, and from our side, I'm gonna describe phase rollout later, uh, but let's say that it's, ju it's just another way of not pushing updates for everybody at the same time, but doing it in a controlled way. Um, from the point of view of a cluster of machines that are all trying to update, we want to put a bit of like um, uh, order, let's say, in this mess. Um, in particular, we try to not reboot the whole cluster at the same time so that if there is a service running on top of it, it's gonna be disrupted, but we try to do it like with some kind of like locking mechanism so that updates are going through slowly one after the other. Um, and then, okay, the end of all of this is like, I want this process to be as reliable as possible, but we are human and we make mistakes. Um, so there is always one phase where we are checking what is going on and we monitor and we are alerted if something is, is bad and we can react to that. And on top of this, like all the components that we're gonna describe, we try, they are mostly like new software based on like ideas that we already had before and we already tried to implement before. Um, something that we want to push for is like making the whole Linux ecosystem, the, the whole Chorus ecosystem a bit safer from the point of view mostly of like memory safety. Um, and so we basically opt in for like languages that are newer than like the old incumbent like C, C++. So most of the software that I'm gonna show you are either written in Go or in Rust. Um, I thought it was a good idea to describe a bit more like what are phase rollout because um, they're not a new concept like in many fields, like in the networking fields you have that for like out updating network devices in the like embedded world, you have the same for like Android devices and so on and so far. Um, in the Linux world, that's not so common. Um, so distribution usually don't work this way. Um, so I'm gonna describe them here a bit like quickly, but hopefully clearly. Um, the main idea behind this is um, there is one point where we as developers, we declare that, okay, we just tagged a new Fedora Core S release. And that happens at a specific point in time, and you cannot like split that over multiple events or whatever. Um, so that one is an atomic point. Um, we do that, and by doing that, we just publish to the public web some artifacts. They could be like AWS images or OS3 repositories or some other like QEMU, QCOW images or whatever. Um, those are automatically like available if you actually know where they are and you, if you want to grab them. Um, but the point is, we don't want every single machine that is already installed somewhere in the world to see that there is, ah, now there is a new um, release that is available, and they're gonna download it all at the same time, uh, which results basically in dosing all the servers that are on the network, providing that image, and also all the machine trying to update at the same time. Um, that is like mildly annoying, but the real problem is if there is actually a bug inside the release that we just made, then all the machines are gonna be hit by the same bug at the same time. Um, so what we do with phase rollout instead is we publish these artifacts, but then we don't announce them on the out update channel. Uh, we do it gradually. We define a time, a T0, where the updates are gonna be starting to be available on the update channel, and then we define like what is the whole rollout window for, for this stuff. Um, and over this time, we gradually go from a zero percentage to 100 percentage of nodes that are receiving these updates. This is done from our side, from the publisher point of view, which means that if you want to do it a bit more aggressively, you can say, I want to be closer to the like zero percent size of the, of the nodes. Um, or if you want to do it like a bit more safely, let's say, or if you are more cautious, you can say, I want to wait for most of the machine around the world to be already eaten by these updates so that I see that there are no bugs, no like, red flags that are raised so far, um, 
And at that point, I also want my machine to um, update and reboot. Um, that basically serves us very well in doing this kind of, we reach all the nodes without updates, but we do it like in a gradual way. And we can also like pause this process. So if we see that something is going wrong, because the first machine that we out update are ours, um, if they have some bugs or something, we can actually stop this process and say, okay, um, this release is actually broken. Uh, we don't push it further. We do a bug fix or whatever. We push the next one, and then we roll out the next one. Um, and that's how we do phase rollout, pretty much. Um, another thing that I want to introduce, because, again, it's kind of like not a new concept in general, but not part of the usual Linux distribution flow, um, is making sure that administrators are able to observe what's going on across the cluster um, from a single point of view. Um, like every single concept in what I just said, it's important, it's a key point. Um, we want to provide a good flow for people to observe what's going on so that they don't have to guess. Like, my machine is rebooting now. Is it rebooting because there is a kernel bug? Is it rebooting because there was a power outage? Is it rebooting because there are out updates? <clears throat> you want to know about this stuff. Uh, when the machine is rebooting, is it because there is a new update that has been applied uh, or not? Is that being really applied, or do we, do we just like reboot it into the old um, OS3 commit? Um, all these kind of answer, like you can get them by I don't know SSHing into a machine or collecting logs into a central um, Kibana or whatever you use for like uh, going through logs. But that's a manual process. It requires a lot of like going through the stuff and searching for information that you find uh, interesting for answering your own question. Um, another approach to this is instead of using like uh, interactive methods and logs and grabbing through stuff, uh, we can instead opt in in another way of doing monitoring observability, which is exposing metrics at multiple levels from multiple contexts um, and then aggregating them some way. Um, and this some way for me personally and for most of the Red Hat at this time, let's say, uh, means this stack of technology, which is Prometheus, which is something that gathers all these metrics in a central point. Um, then Thanos, which is a bit of a new component, which is for history tracking over a long time. Uh, the alert manager, which is sitting on top of Prometheus for reacting to certain conditions, like if those machines are all updating, they are rebooting, but they're not applying updates, or they're not coming back after the reboot, I want to get an alert. Uh, so I don't have to proactively check for stuff, I just get page whenever something is wrong. And then finally, what I'm showing here, which is some way of doing like cool and simple visualization to see at a glance what's going on. Uh, and that's Grafana sitting on top of Prometheus. And that's more or less my goal, let's say, um, making these all the components here easy to be um, monitored this way. Um, so let's focus into the technology. Um, what we're gonna talk today are basically these green boxes here. The whole stack infrastructure is a bit like larger. There are a few more components that are uh, very cool and also very complex, and they can be like covered by separate topics. Um, the one that I care about is the top one, which is the server side, the backends, and the protocol, which is called Cincinnati. And then the lower part, which is um, what is usually running on your own Fedora Cruise machine. And in particular, we're going to zoom on like every single machine running one agent called Zincati. And then the cluster providing some cluster service for um, update um, management, which is RLOC plus the monitoring part. So let's start. Um, one thing here. Uh, does everybody know what is a DAG or a direct acyclic graph? Uh, not, not exactly. Um, so what we, what we are going to do here and what we, what's the main idea behind this protocol and this service is um, instead of just re making releases and then letting people guess what is like from which release you can go to which other release, and when can you update, and so on and so far. We're going to encode this information explicitly into a graph. Uh, a DAG is a specific kind of graph, which is a direct acyclic graph. Um, the two adjective years means that we start from a graph, which means like a few nodes and a few edge connecting them. And then every edge is an arrow, which points in a in a direction, so it is a directed graph, um, and it is a cyclic in the sense that there are no cycles in this graph. You, cannot, you, you can start from some point and you start walking it, at some point you will stop walking, 
as, as you have explored all, the whole graph. You can never like come back to a point that you already visited and start and keep working around. That means that like if you start from any point in this graph of updates, which is where you are currently, you will reach the final end, which is what you want to upgrade to, and that's what you're going to do. And that's the whole idea of the protocol. Um, the protocol itself is something that OpenShift architects um, invented or came with the idea of, uh, and we're just reusing it for Fedora CoreOS as well. Um, the server is um, some simple containerized uh, web service which is running on the Fedora infrastructure. Um, it is providing this JSON-based protocol which describes a graph of updates, um, and it is used for hinting about updates, which means clients can query this service to see, hey, is there any update that you are recommending me to do? And then they are free to either apply it right now or just take this information and keep it for somewhere else for some other action uh, or for any kind of like data tracking or visualization or whatever. Um, what the server does on its own is scraping the Fedora Core OS metadata, that is what we publish when we do releases, uh, and then building a graph out of the, all these metadata. Um, one graph per stream, as I said before, like there are multiple streams going at different paces with different frequencies, and they result in different update graph. Um, then this graph is served to clients that are requesting for it, um, and there are some specific mutations that we can do on this graph uh, in order to make our life as a distribution developer uh, a bit easier and better, specifically when we make mistakes or when we are not sure about some details. Um, and there are three concepts that I'm going to explain in the follow-up slides, um, which are uh, update barriers, uh, dead ends, and the phase rollout that I described before, going a bit more into the details applied to this case. So the first one is um, update barriers. In the general case, we have this graph without cycles, with arrows that are directed in some direction, um, and we can go from any point to any other point, and there could be multiple paths for updating from version A to version C, going through version B, not going through version B, going through some other version, and then coming back to version C, and so on and so far. Um, all these cases, they incur a lot of, like, um, not complexity, but there are many cases that you, can, that you can decide to pick. And there are actually machines that, at different times, they will go through this update graph. Um, from time to time, what we need is, OK, from this point on, we want to rely on some feature that has been introduced um, in the operating system, let's say C group V2 or some other kind of partitioning, file system support, or things like that. Um, in the general case, it's very hard to say, OK, we are coming from a release that didn't have this feature, and now we are upgrading to another release that relies on this feature. So we can, we can easily break stuff if we don't take care of all this complexity, uh, which for humans is kind of like a lot of context to keep in our brain. Um, so what we can introduce at the graph level is some choke points, which means um, if we are before this release and we want to update, we are first to reach this intermediate release. And if we are after this update, it means that all the machines have already gone through this update, which is introducing some features, so we can safely use it. Uh, in this case, as, a, as a, an example, we have this V0, V1, V2, V3, until V5. And in general, we can go directly from, let's say, V0 to V5. If we actually need something that has been introduced in V3, we can say, OK, V3 now it's a barrier, which means that if you are before, you see all the edges are able to reach V3. But if you are after V3, it means that you have gone through V3. There is no way out of that. Either you installed directly at V4, or you went through V3. And so we can say, OK, I know that when I am at V4, it means that I've gone through this edge. Or if I am at V5, I've gone through these two edges, or this other edge. But in any case, I've already been through V3, or I started from a later point. And that's what we, be, what we use for enforcing that some, all the nodes have some specific feature that we need. Um, then there are dead ends. Um, dead ends are things that we would like not to have, uh, but again, as human, we make mistakes. Uh, so from time to time, we end up in a situation where, OK, this machine is broken because we pushed something that is broken, uh, and we cannot update farther out of this because, I don't know, RPM S3 is broken, or the kernel is broken, or something else is broken. Um, so a machine that is ending up at V4, it will try forever and ever to out-update, 
and we, it will never receive an update because there is no way to get out of that, um, which is bad already. But what is especially bad is that the machine itself has no way of knowing that it cannot update further because in the, in the usual case, let's say that this machine is at V5 already, at some point in the future there could be a V6, so it's gonna receive the update for V6. Uh, so we need some way to signal to every machine that it is at V4, hey, your operating system is in some state that is working for you but is not able to out-update further and you need to take some manual intervention. And that's what we do with, uh, with the dead ends. We have the protocol itself, the graph, that is signaling to the machine, hey, you cannot progress farther from here, and the machine itself will raise some kind of flag through observability methods um, for the administrator to actually take some action. Um, and the last one is phase rollout in a bit more like um, technical and context specific way, um, which is some interesting property is we start from this graph, we build it from the metadata, and then we do mutation. Mutation could be like generic, like barriers or um, dead ends, but they can also be specific to specific nodes and they can also vary over time. Uh, specifically for the phase rollout case, if we are at T0, some nodes may be able to see that there is an edge, for example, if they are more aggressive in their update strategy, or some other nodes, uh, they will not see this edge because they decided not to be so aggressive. However, over time, the same exact situation, so the same nodes with the same configuration, they will start seeing, both of them, they will start seeing the edge because the phase rollout has progressed. So, this graph of updates that we are pushing to clients, it's something that is not set in stone, it will change over time, and it's also um, a different graph. I mean, uh, the set of information, the base for the graph is the same for everybody, uh, but the resulting graph depends on each specific node identity and setting. Okay, um, and the last part about um, Cincinnati and the release process is that um, we have been doing more or less the same stuff with container Linux. Uh, one of the main differences is that um, container Linux used to have uh, a proprietary part for this backend because it was actually a service that we were selling to customer. Um, and all of this was based on the traditional, let's say, web administration flow, which is you have a database, you have a web application, you have people that are going through the web panel and they are gonna set, okay, now we are publishing this release, we are publishing it over a phase rollout which takes two days and things like that, uh, which means that all this process was very opaque and it was um, completely contained within a database that, has, that was private on our infrastructure. So it was kind of like hard to audit on the first, in the first place uh, it was a bit hard to observe from the outside what was going on because if you're not actually the admin that is clicking through buttons, then you don't know what is the state. You need to communicate with the rest of your team. Um, so we switched to something which is a bit less eye-catching, like it doesn't have fancy buttons and stuff, uh, but it's a bit more DevOps friendly, which means uh, now we do the same things that is deciding when to make a release, how to, how to push it to, to, to all the nodes uh, based on a GitHub flow. We open tickets, we open pull requests, we do reviews, we go through a checklist, and we basically do exactly what I just described, posing, resuming, update barriers, and so, and so on and so far, but in a way which is easier to track via Git, via reviews, and so on and so far, which makes it like fully public, like if you want to follow how we are doing Fedora Core OS release, you just watch the repository for tickets and pull requests, um, and it's also easy to audit, like, you just go back in the Git history and you see exactly who did what at what time and why. Uh, and there is no sprawling of private database. Like before, if you wanted to set up your own infrastructure, you had to basically ask us as a company to provide you access to our database so that you could sync it in your internal infrastructure. Or what, is actually, what was actually happening, we were selling it as a service for customer. Um, and now, like everything, it's, it's, it's open source, it's free, and you can just basically follow our process and set up your infrastructure using our data. And the result is basically this one, which is uh, on GitHub, we have a list of releases that we plan to do, a list of releases that you did in the past, and every single ticket has its own pull request where we go through all the steps in order and we push a release. Um, and that's basically how we do release engineering nowadays. Again, like, it's not very eye-catching, 
doesn't have any fancy partner to show, uh, but it's kind of like very easy to follow at every single step what's going on. And it also allows for our team, which is distributed over multiple time zones, multiple continents, like I'm in Europe, most of my colleagues are in the US, um, but we can do this all over the world because there is a single coordination point which is explicit, which is this Git-based um, flow. Okay, um, so far more or less I covered all the distribution side. Let's, let's, let's say, how do we publish release? How do we run our services? How they work? What is the theory behind all of this? So we're gonna zoom a bit more into what are your Fedora Colorless machine doing? Uh, the first component that I show is the client-side logic, which is basically querying our service, getting this graph, and, do, and then doing something. Um, this company is called Zincati. It's an update, it's an update agent. Um, we used to have more or less the same for container Linux. We just had to uh, rewrite it in order to work with RPM OS3 and uh, Fedora Core S processes. But the idea is exactly the same. Uh, it is a long-running service. It's running on every single host. Um, it's written in Rust. Um, it is an architecture based on a few actors. There is one actor that is continuously updating his view of the graph. Then there are some actors that are taking some decision about like, when do I want to update? When am I allowed to reboot? And so on and so far. And then there are some other actors that are actually talking to RPM S3 to see what is the status on this specific node. Uh, uh, they are asking RPM S3 to fetch new updates and then they are asking RPM S3 to uh, finalize and reboot. That's exactly what it says here. Um, the design of this component, again, is nothing new. It's just a bit more like influenced by newer technology. Um, specifically, I zoomed on a few things here, uh, which is configuration is done in a way which is very similar to systemd. It takes multiple drop-ins from multiple directories, and then merge all of them together. Um, the configuration format is nothing that we invented. It's just like TOML files, um, which are easy for both humans to write and for other tools to produce transpiling from some other, some other source. Um, and then again, this component itself, it's long running and it has some internal state which is exposed as Prometheus metrics. Um, as I said, it's an evolution of two components that we used to have before in Container Linux. One is called Update Engine and the other one is called Locksmith. Um, and traditionally, the first one was written in C++ and it was like a huge complex beast of C++, and the second one was um, a Golang uh, binary run running on the host. Um, what is interesting from my point of view regarding this piece of software is that uh, before, we didn't have any way to observe what was, going, um, what was going on inside the components that were taking care of out updates, so it was more or less a black box, and we had to guess how was the, um, the node reacting to an update. Um, while right now, we are exposing some metrics. We are exposing these metrics in a local way, that is, on every single node, you can check what's, 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 what is going on by querying a Unix domain socket. Um, and given that this software is architected as a few actors and a state machine that is tracking all of these, we are actually exposing the progress of the state machine via metrics. So you can say, you can actually query this service and ask, him, and ask it, are you actually progressing your state machine? Are you checking for updates on a continuous base? Are you getting errors from, I don't know, from our backend? Are you getting errors from your local RPM OS3? Or what's going on? Without having to check the logs for this service. So the, the service itself is very quiet, let's say. It's not chatting on its log. It's not, uh, it's not <laughs> putting noise in your logs. It's just like uh, most of this information, you get them from the metrics. And if there are actually hard failures, hard errors, then you get them in the logs for retrieving all the information. Um, and then another interesting thing that I'm going to show you later is uh, given that Rust is a language which has like static and strongly types, um, we can encapsulate all the errors in an exhaustive way, which means if some error is happening internally, I also know <coughs> specifically which kind of error I'm seeing. Again, an HTTP error, a local error, some kind of like parsing or whatever, and we can expose these in metrics. So the metrics are a bit more useful than this service is seeing error. The metrics are actually telling me this metric is seeing Sorry, this service is seeing errors of these kinds and is seeing so many errors over this amount of time. This is a bit like unwavy so far, I know. <laughs> I'm gonna show you later in the, in the demo what it actually means. Um, the next component is another piece 
um, that, um, how can I describe it? It's some logic that used to exist, exist inside Locksmith, and then we decided to kind of like split it off to another component uh, in order to decouple a bit what the single node is taking care of versus what the whole cluster is responsible of managing. Um, so the, the main problem is, again, let's assume that you have a cluster of three nodes, but it could be like a cluster of 100 nodes or whatever, uh, but at least more than one or two machines. And you have some service which is running on this cluster, and the service needs to be highly available, let's say 99.9 .9 at least. Um, then you have a problem. You want both the service to be available and you want the machine to out updates in order to cover like security issues, get new kernels, new stuff. Um, so you need to manage somehow, how can I update one node because I have a cluster, so any node can be down while the rest of the cluster is still up and the service is running, um, but doing it in a coordinated way so that the service which is on top of the node is not going down because at least a few nodes are still up. Um, and this is exactly what RLock is providing. It's, it's a fleet-wide reboot manager, which means that it knows about all the nodes that are in your cluster, and it, it's keeping track of reboot status by some kind of like locking mechanism, and it is coordinating which node can reboot at what time. Um, specifically, the, the design, the idea behind this is that you have a semaphore. Um, everybody knows what is a semaphore? Yeah, not really. Um, so a semaphore is, is a primitive in computer science, which means you have some state somewhere, and you have multiple um, agents that are interested in observing this state or mutating this state. Um, so you enforce some kind of like uh, precedence and order between all these consumers so that at most one, or there could be more, uh, at a time can access and mutate this state. And this is exactly what we need for the reboots. We want some machine to be able to reboot, but not all of them at the same time. And we want to kind of like enforce the fact that one machine is rebooting, which means it takes a lock, it goes down, it applies updates, it comes back, and then it is reporting back, hey, I did my reboot so I can unlock my slot. And this is exactly what this very cryptic and small <laughs> sentence says, which is, it's a counting semaphore, which means it's a semaphore that keeps track of how many people, how many agents are locking and unlocking. There is a max of slots that we can have in there. And it supports recursive locking, which means that a machine, if a machine is trying to reboot and then something goes wrong, and then it tries to reboot again, it, it already has a lock. It doesn't need to take another one. Um, and that's exactly what it does. Um, this service, again, it used to be part of the locksmith logic itself, which means that every single node was doing this with some help from a remote database. And we kind of like split it off so that now we have a service which is containerized. It's a Go service. It's a very simple one. Um, it is just acting as a middleman between a database, in our case, etcd3, and every single node. Uh, which means that in our case, we implemented this as a Go service talking to etcd, but you can definitely write something else, like a Ruby service which is running in a container which is talking to a Postgre, because that's what you know and that's what you already have. Uh, and this, this component as well is exposing metrics in the Prometheus format. Um, the idea, again, is decoupling this from the OS so that we provide an implementation but anybody can rewrite it. That's 15, no? Okay. Um, from a visual point of view, it works this way exactly. You have a remote database somewhere, you have this intermediate uh, reboot manager, and then you can define multiple groups of machine, like I have a group of master nodes, I have a group of worker nodes, and they can have different configuration. For example, in this case, uh, the master node, they have one slot, so one node at a time can reboot, while the workers, they have two slots, so two nodes can be down at any time. And if you want to see it as a matrix visualization from Grafana, this is exactly what you get. You have uh, two groups, the master one and the workers one. You have some slots, uh, a maximum amount of slots. For example, one in the master and three in the workers one in this example. Um, and then at any time you have some slots that are locked, which means that some nodes are currently rebooting and the other nodes are waiting, asking for a lock and waiting for the time when this slot is available again. Okay, the last component in all this discussion, it's a bit more focused on the 
Prometheus world and in the, in the metrics world. Um, let me see. Um, okay, I will start from this graph because it makes it a bit easier to introduce. Um, so the problem is Prometheus is something that is reaching to services, uh, usually web services and stuff. It's querying them via HTTP GET requests and it's getting some kind of metrics. And that's all it does. And then it's recording them, showing them, it has some uh, query language, and you can get whatever data you want out of it. Um, the problem in our case is we have some web services. Uh, for example, Airlock is a container, it is a web service, everything is fine. And then we have some other components, for example, uh, Zincati, which is not a web service. It's an agent running locally on your node. Um, and we still want to reach to these service and get these metrics, but we don't have any HTTP service available running in this agent, and we don't want to because there is no need to have it. Um, and that's the case where we are. And so we need a small component in the middle, which is um, something that I wrote, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy if other people are finding it useful, which is the local exporter. The local exporter is running as a container on every single node, and it is just simply bridging between the Prometheus web request and the local Unix domain soccer that socket that Zincati is exposing, and that's all it does. Um, there are a few, a few more cases that I think that could be interesting for other people, so that's why I wrote like a specific component, which is we end up in this situation for many, many other services in Linux, and right now we don't have a good story. Like some services are, are exposing their statistic over Dbus, some other they have like their own file-based protocol where they are just writing to a file the current statistics, some other, they just have some other kind of like UDP base or whatever homemade protocol they want. Um, and my either word or my goal would be unifying all of these so that we can observe all these components um, from a single point of view from Prometheus using some kind of bridging between the different protocols and a different way of exposing metrics. And that's, and that's the local exporter. Um, Again, nothing very interesting here. It's just another Go container. It is just bridging HTTP. You can configure it via TOML. It, it can fan out to multiple services running on the same machine. Um, and it allows to define multiple selector endpoints with their own configuration and so on and so far. You can go like as crazy as you want in this part. This is just like I did just the bare minimum so that I can actually observe what's going on with Zincat. Um, and this is. I don't know so much about metrics. I'm not an observability guy. I had some discussion with the Prometheus guys, and they have something very similar, which is called the node exporter, which is exporting mostly Linux kernel statistics, but also some other stuff, like systemd or NTP or some other, some other things. Um, but I think that like, the main things that I was missing and the main difference is that the node exporter ex expects like, a single metrics blob, let's say, with all the stuff inside, while I don't care about like, observing the whole state of my Linux machine, I just care about some specific services here and there. And that's the, that's the main key point, the main difference, uh, keeping these metrics separate with different points and each one with its own configuration. Um, OK, I think that I cover more or less everything that I wanted. Um, I'm going to go into the demo and into the example, and then we have questions. Um, the example that I'm going to show basically is just all these components put together and then observe from Prometheus and Grafana. Um, specifically, there is one piece that we need to configure, which is running this local exporter and telling the, the local exporter, hey, this is how you reach the Zincati metrics and point. Um, given that we run everything in containers, wherever possible, and I hope that you do as well, uh, in our case, we have a bind mount from the host into this container, and then we tell the container, hey, this is where we provided you the Unix domain socket as a bind mount from the host. Uh, and that's it. And then we set it up as, we call this Zincati, and Prometheus knows how to reach it over some HTTP endpoint. And, and that's it. And that's exactly what we're going to demo right now. Um, so. From the point of view of I'm an administrator, administrator and I just want to see what's going on, um, you can do it in a few ways. Um, Let's start from the beginning. 
And one way is, okay, I am locally logged in on a node, and I want to manually see what's going on. You can totally do it. You just connect it to the, to the Unix socket, where Zincati is exposing these metrics, and then you get the information about what's going on. Uh, this example is a bit stale, but you get, you get some infos, you get an idea about like, what was the last timestamp for refreshing the cache, what was the last timestamp for trying to update the machine, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is what you could do in theory. In practice, you don't want to log into every single machine. You want to do something like, A, let me start exposing this information over the web. This is one of my Canary Fedora Core OS machines uh, running with a uh, local exporter running on it and bridging to HTTP. So this is exactly the same Unix socket information, but over HTTP. Uh, you can see that here there are all the information that you need for monitoring what's going on. For example, what is the current OS version, how many times did we check for updates. Um, this machine doesn't have any error, which is nice, but like, if there is like a gateway timeout or some kind of like transient network error, you will see it here, uh, with the specific kind of, it is actually an HTTP 503 error, a generic one, or more specific things. Um, and this way you can track like, do I have all my machine with updates enabled, or did I disable them on some, on some machine? Uh, when was the last time that we tried to refresh the state, and so on and so forth. And this you can do it like for every single machine. Now, next step, and this is where the last demo is. Um, assuming that you have a cluster with multiple machines, you don't want to check it manually, you want to see it like as graphs. And this is where Prometheus and Grafana are quite nice, because you can set up a Prometheus scraping all your machine, in this case, is a cluster of five nodes. Uh, so Prometheus is aggregating all this information internally, and then you can query this database, this real-time uh, time series tracking, uh, to see what's, what was going on. For example, the demo here is showing a cluster, which is going, a cluster of five machines, which is going through two different version updates at different time. You can see that um, there were five machines starting from one version, and then one by one, they reboot, when they come back, they are at the new version, and this update proceeds. This update proceeds and rolls through the cluster without any problem in this case. And then after a bit, there is a new update which is available, and it does the same. Um, you can track at any point. There is this configuration, this specific configuration of this cluster is allowing one machine to be down, and you can see in the graph that there are just one node at most being down, down at any time. And then in the same place, you can monitor what are the metrics for the um, reboot manager. So is it actually configured with enough reboot slot? Are they being locked, unlocked? Um, at what time a lock is taken? At what time a lock is released? And, and so on and so far. Uh, and from the client point of view, you can see like every client changing state, getting different uh, metrics and different timestamps, and so on and so far. And I think that later on there is also like uh, error metrics and, and other stuff. And that's more or less all of it, going from how do we do updates, how do we configure stuff, how do we manage a cluster of multiple machines that cannot be all going down at the same time, and how do we actually monitor this stuff in a sane way. What I'm not showing here is you can actually uh, get page, getting alerts based on this infor information, uh, just defining like, I want to get a page if more than two machines are down, because this is not an allowed configuration in my cluster. If that happens, it means that something is wrong, um, and so on and so far. And this is more or less how, in the current world, let's say, um, we try to, um, to organize and to monitor and to get alerts on an out-of-date, an out-updating fleet of machines that are behaving like a cluster. That's, that's all, I guess. I, I have less than five minutes for, for questions, so I will just go for a couple of them. I will start with Alban. Uh, do you use Airbag in OpenShift? Uh, the question is, do we use Airlock in OpenShift? Uh, the, answer, the specific answer is no. 
the general answer is no as well. Um, so what I've shown so far is what we are doing for Fedora Core S. Uh, OpenShift is using the same protocol, Cincinnati, uh, but it's a completely different model. So in OpenShift, we don't have a cluster of machines that we need to orchestrate. In OpenShift, we have a cluster which is orchestrating every single component, including the operating system, which means that the cluster operators are taking care of updating both the OpenShift Kubernetes components and the OS itself with some strategy. So they don't use Zincati, they don't use Airlock, but they are based on similar concept, yes. Next one. Yep. Um, so, okay. so the question is like, what is the relationship between the local exporter and Zincati? And the relationship is, on Zincati side, I have internal state and metrics, but I don't have an HTTP service. I don't need an HTTP service. I don't want to bind to a TCP port. I don't want to care about firewalling. I, these are all problems that I don't want to deal with. Um, so on the Zincati side, I can query it locally if I SSH into a machine, but I don't want to SSH into a cluster of 100 machines just to get information. Um, on the other end, Prometheus is able to query HTTP endpoints exposing this kind of information. So what I need is some way, which could be like a batch script or whatever, uh, which is bridging between an HTTP port getting requests from Prometheus and Zincati exposing this information on a local Unix domain socket. And that's all of what the uh, local exporter does. Uh, it does. It could do a bit more in theory because I think that there are other cases that could be covered in this way, but for this specific example, that's all of it. Like you can replace this if you want with like socket and bash and something else, and it would to totally work it. That's, that's fine. Yes, Yes. Cor correct. So the, this, this machine that you see here is just HTTPS something. This web service is the local exporter. This is what it is replying here. The information inside this page are coming from Zincati. So the local exporter is just proxying a request, which is an HTTP request, translating it into the local Unix domain request, getting this information back, and providing it as an HTTP a response, and that's, and that's all of it. Like, one thing I was trying to ask that is like, if you run Fedora for us, you need to know about Zincati. Like, it's on by default. Like, it's what's going to update in your Ruby Row app, like, which is very, very important for any operating system where like, you can scrap all the bugs and optionally can add on to the Yes, that's exactly why they are like different components, not part of the operating system. Like, the operating system, uh, as it says in the slides, uh, it's just, blah, 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 blah. it's just this one. This is like the minimum things running on every single host. All the other components are kind of like how to put together this vision of auto updates and monitoring them. But they are like containers. As you see, like they are all containers. And if they are containers, it means that you can schedule them. If you need them, you can replace them, them with something else. If you have a better solution, that's totally fine. This is just like my opinion, my approach to monitoring this beast, let's say. Next one. I have a question about the local exporter building out. Um, so I, I'm not sure I fully understand the vision. So I understand why the node exporter, like I understand the flaws in the node exporter, but like, so I guess for example, is part of the vision of local exporter that, like say network manager, right? Like you can imagine it exposing metrics about DHCP requests, like mm -hmm. how Um, so the question is like, if you want to plug something else, let's say the, node, uh, the network manager as a provider of information into this flow, how do we do it? Um, how we should do it? Um, my take is that um, network manager will be on this side, just providing metrics in Prometheus format somehow, like over Dbus, Unix, whatever it prefers. Uh, no, no mandatory things here. And then you as an administrator, you will have a configuration that says, out of all these services that are running on my machine, I actually care about Network Manager, but I don't care about Zincati. So I'm going to provide this configuration to the, uh, the local exporter container that says I want to exp 
to expose Zincati, and I know how to reach Zincati, and that's all of it. Or I want to, I want to know about Network Manager, and I know how to reach Network Manager, and that's all of it. But like, I don't think that it's worth it for um, Network Manager itself to provide this information, because anyway, the idea is you run this in a container, so you need to get this configuration to a container. It's not something that the host itself should take care of. But you could totally see like example or kind of like snippets that's how you do it and make it like a bit easier. I'm not saying no, but we're still very far from that point and I don't want to kind of like enforce things on people. That's, that's it. Done? Okay, thank you very much for coming and for the question.